Now, politics, as ordinarily understood, is important. I was a professor of politics for about 45, 46 years. So it's not that I uh, look down on politics. The opposite is the case. But I think that American conservatives have been entirely too attracted to a rather narrow, truncated notion of political power. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Saroof. On the podcast today is Koss Rin, who is Emeritus Professor of Politics at the Catholic University of America, as well as the founding director emeritus of the Center for the Study of Statesmanship, which studies the moral, cultural, and political preconditions of peaceful and respectful relations among persons, peoples, and civilizations, and explores sources of foreign policy and domestic leadership in keeping with the American traditions of restraint and compromise. Rin is also the editor of Humanitas, the center's flagship journal, as well as the author of many books, including the recently published The Failure of American Conservatism and the Road Not Taken, which is the sub- subject of our episode today. So welcome to the podcast, Professor Rin. Thank you. And before we begin our interview, I'd like to thank you the listeners for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is educating for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling this mission, make sure to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, Before we discuss your new book about American conservatism, I'm curious about your background as someone originally hailing from Sweden and uh, what the state of Swedish conservatism is, um, especially while you were growing up, and what it is today, uh, if you keep up with it, how you became enamored with the American political right at the beginning of your long career as an American academic. Because I think we've discussed, obviously, American conservatism on this podcast, along with British conservatism, um, but never Swedish. So we'd love to hear more about uh, that landscape. The short answer is that the reason I ended up in the United States is that I saw little future for an academic uh, of my general inclination in Swedish academia. And um, I started to pay attention to American intellectual conservatism when I was quite young. So I was aware of human events. I was aware of National Review. And um, I was just interested in it. I would read uh, Russell Kirk, for example, and before that, Irving Babbitt, Uh, a figure from the 1920s and 30s. And I was generally attuned to what was happening in the United States. As a matter of fact, I and a colleague wrote the first book published anywhere about modern American intellectual conservatism, post-war conservatism. It was published back in Sweden, of, uh, of all places, in 1971. That is considerably before the volume about conservatism that everybody knows about, George Nash's uh, much thicker book. But in any case, to make a long story short, um, I felt that in order to have a good chance of having an academic career and live the life of a scholar, I would need to change my birth. And that is what I did. You also asked about what is the state of conservatism in Sweden? Well, at the time when I was studying it, there wasn't all that much of it. There were th- people may have had certain inclinations, uh, prejudices in the good sense of the word, but there was precious little philosophically serious exploration of conservative thinking so that you would have plenty of people familiar with the thinking of Edmund Burke or something like that. Um, whereas in America, by contrast, you had many different sources to go to of contemporary writing that explored precisely those sources. Turning then to the new book, one of its major themes is, and this comes through in the introduction, is that part of the failure of American conservatism is the tendency to create too sharp a separation between politics and society generally, or maybe a particular culture. Um, And so between the political and the not political. And so, one of the things that I found interesting was that you're making an argument for the, I guess, the non traditionally non political sources that influence politics, like language, uh, general culture, aesthetics, 
things of that sort. How encompassing do we need to be uh, when we consider the notion of the political in ordinary daily life? Yes, encompassing as we could possibly be. And we have to recognize that um, the culture is upstream from politics. What happens in politics has its origins in things that have happened often a very long time ago. Now, politics, as ordinarily understood, is important. I was a professor of politics for about 45, 46 years. So it's not that I uh, look down on politics. The opposite is the case. But I think that American conservatives have been entirely too attracted to a rather narrow, truncated notion of political power. Now, that's a, in a way a separate issue, but another way of it, of um, formulating the challenge that I have for this point of view is to say that politics is something far more subtle than most intellectual conservatives have realized. And this is despite the fact that in the, in the 1950s and even earlier, there were significant thinkers, most especially Russell Kirk, who understood perfectly that this was the case, that the culture, uh, that which shapes the mind and the imagination within a people will set the direction for the long term. Now, uh, Russell Kirk was an independent thinker, but he had been profoundly influenced by an American thinker, uh, a major intellectual figure, that is Irving Babbitt, who died in 1933, the author of Democracy and Leadership and Rousseau and Romanticism, among other works. And he had drawn uh, Russell Kirk's attention to the centrality of the imagination as a source of good or evil. It's the people who capture the imagination of the people who ultimately set the basic direction of a society. I really love that response because um, actually this weekend, ISI held its annual homecoming um, at our uh, headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware. And I had the absolute pleasure of um, moderating a debate between the poet Dana Joya and a local art historian, um, Barksdale Maynard, who specializes in the art of Howard Pyle and um, the Wyatts, the, the Wyatt uh, son and father, who of course are um, lived in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, not far from, the, from ISI's headquarters. And I was really pleased with the number of people who approached not only me, but my two interlocutors, telling them that they were so happy that a conservative or organization included um, the, the remarks and uh, conversations surrounding, you know, art history, poetry, um, the fine arts and literature um, in, in their programming and, um, how there are even people, you know, these are conservatives, mind you who said, you know, I, I write poetry on the side. It's a hobby of mine. People who surprised me quite frankly, because they, they first and foremost, I considered them as professional, um, you know, people who, who worked in, who worked in politics or on Capitol Hill. So diving deeper on one of your critiques is of movement conservatism is it's misunderstanding of what moves a civilization along and, it seems like you know they focus too greatly on acquiring political power rather than paying attention to these great civilizational works of art um, and and you know film literature civic culture genuine philosophy um, and education for that matter. So the things that elevate the soul and um, I, I mean I consider the barometers of what civilization is. So I'm wondering you know I, even as conservatives hold about half of the political power in Congress and you know, majority of governorships and state legislatures, um, we definitely do not control most of our culture today. Uh, I'd say, you know, most of American life is dominated by the left. So is this what you had in mind when you, you know, you're talking about a more expansive de definition of politics that even if you control the levers of power in American society, whether that's in the halls of Congress, um, these political efforts will be ultimately feckless if the culture is, you know, thoroughly uh, liberal and democratic? And what do you see being the um, the counterweight to, uh, like, what would conservatives have to do to be able to um, even compete on the, uh, on, on the, the field of, of arts and culture to be able to kind of, you know, compete with the left and maybe influence American society in that way? 
American intellectual conservatism in the post-war period in the 1950s, or even in the 40s, looked very promising in this regard. It had, or many of the leading thinkers, had a full appreciation of the centrality of the imagination. Um, that is, to shape the mind and the imagination is to get to the heart of the matter. Politics is a kind of afterthought, although in the short run it can often be very important, whether to go to war or not, for example. But the general frame of mind in which you approach a question of war and peace, to take that as an example, is all important. Are you in a belligerent frame of mind? Um, are you haughty and arrogant? Are you going to run roughshod over uh, the weak? Or are you going to have a more civilized disposition and be willing to work out differences, respect minorities, and so on? Everything depends on whether you have statesmen available, that is, civilized people available to make important decisions, or you're going to have people who are all wrapped up in the trends of the day. Uh, if you take Russell Kirkus' example, or if you take uh, a person contemporary with him, Peter Virek, they understood this perfectly. <clears throat> But in 1955, um, National Review magazine was started. Bill Buckley was a brilliant polemicist, a very gifted person, had uh, diverse interests, and he was even interested in um, uh, the, the arts. Uh, do I rem misremember this, or was he even able to play the organ? <clears throat> he was more than superficially interested in matters of culture, but his great fascination and the great fascination of National Review was to promote ideas so as to make possible the capture of the U.S. presidency. First, it was Barry Goldwater in 1964, who got nominated partly because of the intellectual work already done by the National Review Circle. And then in the 1980s, the movement conservatives, as they were now called, celebrated the triumph of Ronald Reagan. Now, I remember <coughs> observing these celebrations, the triumph of conservatism, and shaking my head because I knew that while certain political victories had been won by a person assumed to be conservative, American culture was continue, continuing to slide in a very different direction. Uh, in the 1960s, late 60s, and early 70s, we had um, the count counterculture and the new left. <coughs> Pardon me. And many conservatives were thinking, well, uh, we've gotten over that. Uh, this has subsided, and we can get on with our project of capturing the presidency and the Congress. Now, I knew, there's not, no special insight here, that what the counterculture and the new left manifested was something very old in Western culture, a kind of cultural radicalism. I call it liberationism. Liberationism in the sense that um, the left wants to get rid of all the traditions of the Western world. Uh, the new left and the counterculture were just particular manifestations of something that had been changing Western civilization for a long time. And then when we got recently to the cancel culture and woke, many intellectual conservatives were like deer in the headlights and wondering, what's this? Well, there was no mystery about it. Something like that was bound to happen because the general trends in American academia were running in the same direction as they had been running for decades and decades. Uh, talking about the imagination, that's what you call the unrecognized power of, um, I guess, political life. Um, and that's sort of the road not taken is that we we went for politics rather than for cultivating the imagination. And you also catalog in the book about how uh, sort of Rousseau is sort of, I guess, one of the great villains in the sense of uh the degradation of this idea of the imagination and turning it towards uh, humanitarianism. So I'm wondering if you could explain that a bit more, because I even notice when I'm discussing with friends who are on of the left or family members who are of the left, when I'm talking about sort of conservative ideas or I guess arguing back and forth with them about, you know, 
the goods and ends of politics or of, you know, just the good life in general, they call it cold and depressive and with no room for, uh, you know, any actual human being. And I think that speaks to the, the sort of idea of uh, like a humanitarian moral superiority on their part or that they're holding. Um, so how do we get out of that trap as well? Well, sentimental humanitarianism is a phrase that was used by Irving Babbitt. And um, we're now in a complicated area, and so I have to try to be very brief explaining it. Uh, we're all familiar today with virtue signaling, the uh, wholly dominant mode of morality virtue today is virtue signaling. That is, you signal that you empathize, you suffer with the uh, downtrodden, you squeeze uh, 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 a tear out of your eye when you hear about the people who are starving and so on. That makes you a noble person. From a traditional point of view, let's say a Christian point of view, that has nothing to do with morality whatsoever. Morality is indistinguishable from personal character. And that means that if you're virtuous, it's because you have managed to clean up your own life. That is, you have managed to put a damper on your egotism and self-indulgence, whatever bad traits human beings are inclined to, uh, to de develop. So the heart of Christian love, for example, has never been uh, to empathize with the downtrodden, to empathize with those who suffer in some distant place. You know, very... Um, large collectives, like the poor or something like this, people who are very conveniently were very far from the particular individual. No, the commandment to love God and to love neighbor brings you right into the present. Uh, this is about how you deal with people of flesh and blood, with names and faces, right here. And you're not going to be able to do right by them unless you cleaned up your own act to some extent. You can't be your usual egotistical, self-indulgent, intolerant self. You have to improve yourself. And of course, Western civilization, whether it's Greek or Christian, argues that you need help. Human beings are fallen, imperfect. They need family. They need communities. They need church. They need human institutions to help humanize them, to turn them into decently virtuous human beings. What Rousseau did was to announce on the basis of a revelation that he had had that this is all a profound misunderstanding of human condition. Human beings have nothing to fear from themselves. What they have to fear is all of the traditions, institutions that have been inherited. Family as it now exists, church is a particular enemy, but even the arts and the sciences he describes as helping to imprison human beings. Imprison, imprisoning what? The goodness that is ours by nature. Look at the little baby, how cuddly and warm and good it is. This is a sort of vision of a different approach to life that he, um, he ha that he's able to capture the imagination of Western men and women with. And from this follows an entirely new understanding of politics. And so he has his social contract idea of majoritarian rule, where a general will will guarantee that everything is done according to a common good. Nothing could be more distant from a traditional Christian or classical understanding of politics, which always assumes that we need to be on our guard against the worst side of ourselves. The framers were looking for a constitutional system that would bring our better angels to the fore. That is for Rousseau a nasty, uh, oppressive idea. And we need, to be Ill, we need to be liberated from that whole way of thinking. We have to cancel culture. He doesn't use that phraseology, but he was certainly an advocate of cancel culture. I want to pivot a little bit while on that note so that we can address uh, Leo Strauss while you're with us today, because um, I actually studied Strauss a few years ago as part of a fellowship. And Tom is probably reading a lot of Strauss right now for a fellowship, that, the same fellowship that I'm doing. So I definitely want to, for my own uh, 
you know, personal gratification, definitely um, talk about Strauss and the Straussian school and their anti-historicism, um, especially as, as Burkeans, because I remember learning about that and thinking, mm, not sure how that, um, how that jives with my, my personal beliefs from, from that Burkean lens, but the, there's this propensity for purely abstract theorizing and, um, you know, Strauss and the Straussian school, they were proponents of what you call value-centered historicism. So how... no, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Yeah. Did you say that they were proponents of value-centered historicism? Oh, sorry. The critics of, uh, critics of it. <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, opposite of what I just said, but wondering how you think that Strauss and his students and their influence in conservatism may have not been, um, were there failures that occurred because of that or in what way did it impact, um, American conservatism? Because there's, multiple different schools. I think a previous episode, we actually discussed um, not only the West Coast and East Coast Straussians, but apparently there's also Midwest Coast, Midwest Straussians as well. So um, strong influence, but I'm interested in hearing how you think, um, how Strauss and his students influenced conservatism and perhaps part of its failure. There is much uh, about this subject in the book. And um... I, I don't want to give the impression that everything that Strauss and Straussians have produced has been destructive or undermined American conservatism, but there are certain ideas, one key idea, which I think has substantially contributed to the undermining of American conservatism. As a matter of fact, um, that element has distracted many Americans from uh, the, looking with respect on their own cultural traditions, their moral, spiritual traditions. That is very briefly put, Strauss and the Straussians argue that what they call natural right, their a term for what is ultimately normative, is incompatible with the ancestral, the conventional. Strauss goes to great length, belabors this point that Everything is um, philosophically questionable that does not uh, um, assume the existence of a wholly abstract, ahistorical standard, something that does Plato one better, the Plato of the Republic with his idealism. And the point I'm making is that um, not to have an appreciation for what human insight into universality owes to a long-standing tradition and previous generations is to divert people from the need to cultivate whatever made possible in the case of the U.S., American constitutionalism. American constitutionalism did not uh, uh, all of a sudden appear on the scene because some uh, smart people had uh, a few nifty ideas. These people were clearly standing in a long-standing classical and Christian tradition as channeled through British culture. That's who they were. They were British elite, you might say. And uh, they had not only political ideas, but they had music, they had the Bible, they had classical training. Most people who wanted to amount to something in American society had to uh, be educated, and that education has been described as classics, classics, and more classics. You couldn't get into uh, Harvard University without already knowing Greek, for example. And what was the purpose of knowing Greek? It was to be able to avail yourself of intellectual and artistic treasures. The, the kind of influences that shape people for the better. Uh, so a very serious flaw in post-war conservatism, once it evolved, was this um, anti-historicism that you must not be guided by tradition. Now, many R Roman Catholics thought when they heard this that they were hearing something like Thomism. You know, Thomism believes that reason is central to discovering uh, the higher life. What they didn't uh, point out or weren't sufficiently aware of is that for Thomas Aquinas, reason and tradition are very closely linked. Go to his treatise on law, for example. 
Convention is not, or tradition is not the final word, but it is what tends to direct people uh, in the direction where they need to put a lot of attention. So here, this I could talk about a great deal in the book, and uh, it was partly because of National Review and Bill Buckley that anti-historicism, very awkwardly and paradoxically, became a part of a movement called conservative. Conservative of what? Well, it was pretty clear to Peter Virick or Robert Nisbet or um, Russell Kirk that this was a matter of not imitating a, a longstanding culture, classical and Christian and British, but to have it as a source of enlightenment. See, individual human beings, even the smartest among us, are not all knowing. They're certainly very far from omniscient. So we need help, partly for moral reasons. And here are these old traditions which point you in, the, uh, in a particular direction, aids you toward an understanding of understanding what is ultimately normative. I wish we had more time to talk about uh, Leo Strauss and your critique of the anti-historicists, but do know that you know, when I'm at the Publius Fellowship in a few weeks, um, some of the things that you're saying in the book and that you're saying here will hopefully enlighten and um, make more interesting some of the conversations I'll be having with, uh, my, fellow, with my fellow fellows. Um, but we're, we are starting to come to the uh, end of our time. So I wanted to ask um, how you see the current landscape of the right as part of the political realignment that's been taking place in the last six or seven years. Um, because if the history of conservatism is uh, a history in many ways of weaknesses, contradictions, and failures, maybe is this realignment uh, something that's vindicating a lot of the ideas that you've been putting forth throughout your career with some of the different, uh, I guess, coalitions that have come to the fore, whether that's national conservatism or post-liberalism, or maybe a renewed interest in uh, paleoconservatism and thinkers like uh, you know Samuel Francis, Paul Gottfried, people who are interested in uh, some of the German historicists like Hegel um, or some of the like other non-political elements of politics um and maybe we could also ask if you're optimistic or pessimistic about um conservatism's chances to push back against the wokeness that's uh gripped our age i think the conservatives are on the whole pretty much rudderless and confused but also scared because they see what's happening to the united states and so uh there's an understandable um, inclination to lash out against everything that is going wrong. And there's clearly a, a good reason to think that. But I think American conservatives are in danger of repeating their old mistakes. That is the first requirement of doing uh, or undertaking good countermeasures is to have a good diagnosis. What went wrong? What is the reason that we got caught unawares, for example, of, of woke and, and cancel culture? Shouldn't we have been able to understand that and take countermeasures before it burst on the scene? Precisely. There's if you lack, if you haven't cultivated the sources of, shall we call it Western wisdom? It's not only Western, but let's begin there. It's our part of the world. If you don't have access to a rather refined understanding of those traditions that we have talked about, you're likely to size up the current historical situation the wrong way. And think, for example, that maybe politics, uh, muscular politics might set everything right that we have neglected for decades and decades and decades. So uh, we have to be on our guard against uh, sort of thoughtless, presentist reaction. I mean, there's no question in my mind that the situation is an emergency. But in such circumstances, more than any other time, you need to have a subtle understanding of what is the problem. And the problem ultimately, ultimately is one of imagination, of morality, of culture. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, but if people would like to know more about your work or perhaps read your book, where can they find you? I assume they can probably order your book on Amazon or 
other places where books are sold? Yeah, the usual places. Great. And of course, um, my book is uh, about two thirds uh, a collection of previously published materials and they point in all kinds of different directions. Excellent. Well, we will plug your book in the show notes. So any listeners who are um, interested, you can check there for um, a link to purchase it. And thank you again so much for joining us today, Klaus. This was a pleasure. My pleasure too. All right. And thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to head over to isi.org slash resources to take advantage of all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.